Maya, just a couple of weeks ago, you picked up your third Emmy nomination for the Big Bang Theory. Uh, you're getting to be an old pro at this Emmy thing now. <laughs> it doesn't feel like it, but thank you. Earlier this year, you did something I thought amazing, and that is you got your first SAG nomination as an individual performer. Of course, the, the cast had been nominated and, and still was nominated as an ensemble, but the reason I say it's a, a, a very impressive is, as you know from going to those, they don't have supporting at SAG. It's almost always for TV categories, you'll lead performers. Occasionally, you'll see a, a supporting person slip in there, but uh, that's very impressive. What did you think of that? Um, first of all, thank you. I mean, the that was the main reason I totally did not have it on my radar that I might be nominated, um, was that there is no supporting category, and I'm clearly a supporting actress and happy to go. Um, so it was very, very um, surprising and just such an honor to be acknowledged by the SAG community because it's literally actors who know um, not just how hard it is to do what we do, but how complicated it is to be part of an ensemble in particular. Yeah, I've talked to many of your cast members over the past couple of years, and, and we talked about SAG. That that I think that's one of the greatest prizes in all of entertainment, and that is that ensemble prize uh, because you know, you, you know, you're, Jim's often singled out. You've been singled out lately, but for all of you to go together and be celebrated together, even though you didn't win this particular time, that, that must be really uh, make you all very happy. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a nomination is such a huge honor that you're you're in that pool of people. So, yeah, it's a tremendous honor for all of us. Now, for this upcoming Emmy Awards, you have submitted the episode, The Indecision Amalgamation. Um, describe that to people that haven't seen it. Tell people what, what that one was about. Um, yeah, the, this episode was where Sheldon is trying to decide between two video gaming systems, and um, Amy is not a video gaming person, and so there's a, a series of scenes and conversations between the two of them. Uh, the scene that was kind of most memorable for me uh, this whole season was where I'm trying to pretend to be interested because he says I'm not acting interested enough, and I act interested and end the scene by screaming, pass the butter, because that's how the scene started, was I was trying to get him to pass the butter before he started obsessing about video games. <laughs> My favorite thing about that scene is when you switch gears from the very beginning where you definitely aren't interested, but you switch gears to pretend like you are, and he doesn't even, he's like thrilled that you're now interested. Right, I mean, I think we got to sort of uh, take advantage of Sheldon's sort of inability to understand those social subtleties with that scene in particular. And then a, a great scene at the end where you're actually in the store and, and ultimately you just decide, okay, we're getting, we're, we're finished with this, I'm just going to buy both systems for him. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, obviously the kiss that, that, that Amy and Sheldon shared this year was very memorable and very talked about, um, but for me, that, that episode, you know, where, where there was a series of scenes showing kind of the progression and sort of comedic pro progression is why I chose it. Was there any other show, uh, episode from this season on your radar? Was it narrowed down to two or three? Um, I usually let uh, Jim Parsons and Bill Prady pick for me, and so that's what I did this year. And it was kind of down to the kiss or the, the video game uh, debate. And so, um, so yeah, it was really just down to those two, between the two of them. Well, Jim definitely knows what he's doing. He's got three of these <laughs> on his mantle already. That's what I figure, so I usually ask his opinion. You know, we chatted with him uh, two or three weeks ago. Well, I guess it was before the nominations, and uh, he, he chats with us every year. and one of the things I talked to him about was, uh, and you may may or may not be well aware of this, but if he wins this year a fourth time, he sets he ties the record for this category. Uh, Michael J. Fox, Kelsey Grammer, Carol O'Connor, wow. all in the family. So uh, wow. I hope all of you realize that. That's amazing. That's really spectacular. Has uh, has he put on any kind of airs over the years, being the, the the big Emmy winner on the show? No, it's always right back to work for Jim. He's a, a consummate professional, and um, there's no one more deserving, I think. And when Johnny was nominated in that category, it was a very, very hard year because um, we've got really strong actors on our show and actresses. And Bob Newhart was a big winner for you last year? Absolutely. That was a really big deal to be part of that for him. And we talked, I got, uh, he's one of my all-time favorites, and I got to chat with him about this time last summer, and uh, of course we talked Emmys for the first few minutes, but I, we just picked his brain about his career because it's been so impressive. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned the uh, the train episode from earlier in the season. Um, 
tell me about just getting that script and and what that meant for the dynamics on the show. Um, it meant a lot. You know, I think it, it means a lot on sort of two levels. You know, it means a lot for the characters to be moving to that place after so many years, and especially the way that our writers chose to do it, I think was really elegant and really touching and beautiful. But it also means a lot for the actors, you know, for me and Jim to um, to get to the place in our acting process where we're ready for that and where our characters are ready for that. And that's a very intimate moment, you know. It's an intimate moment for our characters, but it's also very intimate for the actors that portray them. So it was a really special week. I talked to both Canal and Simon back a few weeks ago, too, and one of the things we talked about, uh, I think one of them brought it up, and then I brought it up on the next chat, was the writers on your show, the producers on your show, really have a, a knack for figuring out the speed of how to move relationships along. Not too fast, but not too slow either. I think that, you know, Chuck Lorre is, has joked that, you know, watching our show is like watching paint dry. Um, there, there's not a lot that has to happen or that needs to happen, and I think it's important to realize that as much as we're a, you know, a popular show and now we've gotten, you know, some critical acclaim, we're not, it doesn't make us into a soap opera that just because, you know, more people are watching that we need to move things along every week and touch on every single plot every week. And I think that's a really elegant way that Chuck and Steve Malaro and Bill Prady handle our show and the way all of our writers handle it. We don't need to continue every single plot every week. We're allowed to drag things out and let things progress, often the way relationships do. Well, and not doing the same thing over and over, at least all the time. I'm thinking back to, like, the scavenger hunt episode where all of you are combined together in different combinations than we normally see you. Uh, I'm sure that one was a really fun one to, uh, to not only shoot, but to do the table read and everything else. Yeah, I mean, I had been I had been begging both publicly and privately to have scenes with Simon Helberg, um, who is an incredible comedian, and um, I just respect him and learn from him so much. And I feel like I learned more in that week working with Simon that closely than I have in years. Um, he's so amazing, and I, I loved how much our writers were willing to mix it up with that episode. It was very unusual, and we just loved it. I want to ask you just a couple of technical questions, because the show is so popular. I don't know if people understand, and I don't particularly on your show understand. Just, I want to talk about the dynamics. Uh, well, first of all, when, when do you go back to shoot a new season? What, what uh, time of the year? Um, but now ish, uh, the, the end of summer comes, uh, beginning of August for, for us. So yeah, we go back soon. I think several of the drama series, uh, to give you perspective, I, I was setting up a chat with somebody for this Friday and they, they were already in production. So you do have a little bit longer off than they do. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and then talk to me about just a typical week. When, when do you get a script for a new episode? We get scripts the night before we start working on them. So we work a, a five-day week that starts on a Wednesday. So um, we get the script Tuesday night, late Tuesday night, usually while we're filming the previous week's episode. We um, read through it for the writers on our first day of the week, which is Wednesday, do a little bit of rehearsal, but then it's rewritten Wednesday night. We rehearse Thursday, it's rewritten Thursday night, we rehearse Friday, then we have over the weekend for the writers to rewrite things and then we film kind of unusual or difficult scenes Monday, and Tuesday is when we do the bulk of our show in front of a live audience. Okay, and what amount of change would you say on a given week uh, occurs because of the audience and their reactions? Um, enough that it really matters that we film in front of a live audience. Uh, Chuck Lorre is arguably the most successful man currently um, in television, I would say. He knows exactly what works, and um, even if something's funny to all of our writers and all of our cast and all of our crew, if the two or three hundred people sitting there watching don't think it's funny, he will change it because um, that's who it has to be funny for. And um, a lot of times some really subtle and really important things happen in front of the audience. And what's that process like? Do you huddle together and figure it out? Do the writers huddle together? How does it work uh, it, when you're live? Yeah, it's all the writers figuring it out, and the actors get to talk and laugh and joke and take breathers in between. So, you know, for people who come and see our show filmed live, um, they get to see a lot of social interaction, because a lot of times our writers will sit on something. Sometimes we'll have a half-hour break just waiting for them to rewrite something. And what's a typical length for a Tuesday night? Hmm. Um, it takes about five or six hours to film those 24 minutes that you see on your TV screen. 
So, uh, yeah, that's our longest day, and we're often there till 10 or 11 at night. And how many in a row will you do with before a break? Um, it depends. We typically work three episodes, and then we get a week off. But because Chuck has so many shows, sometimes we'll do two and then one, and sometimes we'll do one episode and then have a hiatus. It really just depends on kind of all four shows, holiday vacations, everybody's needs for hiatus. The other thing I wanted to ask you about, since since you're such a, a pro now at the uh, all these award shows, um, talk to me about the difference now that you've gone to all of them of the Emmys, the event itself being there versus the Globes versus SAG Awards. Um, okay, so the thing about the Emmys is there's no food and there's no drink. You're sitting in a theater, so that's something that you have to know. You're kind of just really in it to sit there and watch like a really long movie. Um, the Golden Globes are kind of the fanciest. Uh, it's you know the highest profile of movies, celebrities, and um, at that one you usually get like champagne and tea sandwiches and tiny desserts. It's it's often judged by what food you get. And I have found that SAG Awards is the most enjoyable in terms of culinary experience. And you're also at a table, and usually it's a rectangular table, which is just a different kind of I think more comfortable dynamic than a big circle table. Since for us, you know, it's the time that our cast gets to hang out together, not at work. So. And on the, when you're doing like a Globes or a SAG of the last say four or five years, any particular star that, especially like a film star, that you're like, oh, you see him across the room, you go, I've got to go say hello. Um, I've been thinking that about Denzel Washington for a couple years, but I haven't gotten up the nerve to go over to him. Well, you, you, I think I've, I've earned that right. You, you, he, he would know who you are. I'll let him know when I jump on him. <laughs> it might lead to a film part. You never know. That's true. If you don't, if you don't particularly, you know, especially uh, jump on him, as you say. <laughs> Hey, I saw the uh, uh, the hub stuff that you've done for Blossom, and all the chats I've done with you. We've never talked about Blossom. What was that like getting back together with with uh, some of those cast members? It was great. I mean, you know, we spent formative years of our lives together, and so it's been a long time. But we're really happy that that Blossom is finally getting sort of its time in syndication. So it was really fun to get together um, and and be able to kind of really act reminisce, not just over coffee. Uh, what kind of reaction now that they've been airing a couple of weeks? Have you heard from new um, new fans that are discovering it for the first time? Um, I know my parents are really excited, and my mother informed me they are watching every single episode and experiencing it all again for the first time. Um, I'm hearing a lot of people really enjoying it from a nostalgia perspective, but um, I'm hoping that some of the larger audience that had you know wasn't alive when it came out the first time is also enjoying it. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, one of the great things about it was it, it you know, it, it really did appeal to kids and teens and so forth. So yeah, that, a, that group now, like you say, that wasn't even born, that they all love that. Right. Makes me feel old, but it's true. <laughs> did you go back to watch episodes for this? No, I haven't watched most of the episodes of Blossom. I never really liked watching myself and uh, don't need to see it again a second time. And you're about to be doing double duty on TV. You were just telling me what's the, what's the big news that's breaking this week? Yeah, uh, TV Land is bringing back the original Candid Camera, and I am co-hosting it with Peter Funt. Um, I was a fan when I was a kid, and I guess because of my sort of uh, interest in in science and the way people behave, it's kind of the ultimate original reality show and sort of social experiment in terms of what people will believe and how they will behave in unusual situations. And um, what specifically will you do on there? What What's your role? Um, I'm co-hosting it. So basically I do the introductions and the, the closing bits to all of the gags that are done. You're not out in the, in the public doing some of the gags? I am not out in the public. My life in the public is working on Big Bang. <laughs> <laughs> well, you ought to find a way at least once or twice over the course of a candid camera season to, to go out in disguise and do something fun. <laughs> nope, not in my contract. <laughs> When does that debut? Uh, when does it debut? This fall, soon, within the month. I don't have the date off the top of my head because we literally are just releasing the news now. But not a long way off. It's coming up soon. No. No. Soon. <laughs> well, listen, uh, great luck at the Emmys again this year. Enjoy it. Uh, you got Seth Meyers hosting, so even though you're glued down to a seat, that ought to be fun. <laughs> I hope so, yes. I'm actually looking forward to that very much. Well, listen, have a great rest of your summer, and thanks so much. Thank you. Nice talking to you again.